I want to talk with you about the power of radio in the 21st century. Jesus lived but 33 years. He taught with simplicity. He gave birth to no corporations. He established one powerful organization, the Church of Jesus Christ. He gave but one charter. He said, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to every person. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news. We call it the Great Commission. It is recorded by all four writers of the Gospels. Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, and John verse 15, 16. Have you ever thought much about the challenge that confronted those who first began to spread from Jerusalem? I mean, who would believe this fact that someone lived and died and had risen again? We have come a long ways, and in our lifetime, things have happened that hitherto were absolutely impossible. For example, we have walked on the moon. Neil Armstrong was there July the 2nd in 1969. Number two, the internet has been introduced. That came in 1970. And number three, there is satellite transmission that will allow the whole world to be come together and hear and see things. But two things have not happened. Number one, the needs of the human heart have not shrunk. They are greater than ever. And number two, it seems that world leaders have learned very little from the failures of the past. There are two questions that I would put to you today. Number one, is everyone important to Jesus Christ? And then question number two, what is the best means of reaching everybody with the good news of the gospel? In regard to question number one, everyone is important to Jesus Christ. He has no throwaway children. Every person who lives on planet Earth needs to hear the good news that Jesus Christ can forgive your sin, can give you a hope and a future, and can impact and change your life. Jesus said very simply, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Question number two, what is the best means of reaching our generation? It was that very question that first propelled us to think about using radio as a tool for evangelism. My wife and I were praying about the future and how God wanted us to invest our lives. I was pastoring a church. I sat down with the president of FEBC and we talked. I shall never forget how that he impacted my life. And he said, Bob Bowman said, Harold, pastoring a church is one thing. Radio is something else. He said, in radio, you've got to take it by faith because you can't see the people. But radio is alive and well. When Jesus gave us the Great Commission, the world's population was approximately 250 million people. It took roughly 1,500 years from the time of Christ to the time of Martin Luther for the population to double, reaching 500 million. And then it took only 330 years for the population to double from 1,500 to 1830, and it reached the figure of one billion people. And then it took only 100 years for the population to double again, 1932 billion people. In 1960, the world's population crested four billion. In 1960, the population crested three billion. In 1976, four billion. In 1986, five billion. Today, the world's population stands at 7.9 billion people. 
And the reality is, every time the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, another 200,000 have been added to the world's population. It is my conviction that God has allowed breakthroughs in communication that paralleled the rise in the population. You can go back and you can put the population growth on a chart and then the breakthroughs in population and as there is a jump, there is a new breakthrough in communication. And I believe that God has allowed that so that followers of Jesus Christ could take the message of the gospel and share it with every person who's on the face of the earth. In, 19, in 1896, an Italian electrical engineer and inventor whose name was Guglielmo Marconi lofted the first radio signal translated from Cornwall to Newfoundland. In 1920, the first radio station went on the air, KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States. And then in 1931, the first international Christian radio station went on the air. It was in the heart of the Andes, Quito, Ecuador. And the call letters on that station were HCJB. A man by the name of Clarence Jones was the spark plug that really made that thing happen. And it stood for heralding Christ Jesus blessings. But the staff joked and they called it, Hear Clarence Jones Broadcast. When they built that station, people told him, Ecuador, 10,000 feet above sea level, one of the worst places in the world to have a radio station. But the Spirit of God led them in placing the station there because it was like a high point and it could reach hundreds and hundreds of miles with the good news of the gospel. And then shortwave radio was discovered. When we were living here, Han Brown, who was with Far East Broadcasting Company, kind of a representative of FBC, FEBC to the government and so forth, told us the story of an ambassador from a little island in the South Pacific who was sent to the Philippines. He met with President Marcos for the first time. He said, Mr. Marcos, I am very happy to be here with you. And President Marcos turned to him and he said, do you have a wife and a family? He said, yes, I have one wife and seven children. And again, he said, um, uh, Oh, how did you learn your English? He responded, shortwave radio. <laughs> well, shortwave radio had its place, and it also had its problems. And then came the event that changed the world. December the 7th, 1941. The Japanese bombed John Hay Air Base here in the Philippines first, and then only hours later, they bombed Pearl Harbor. My earliest childhood memory was the radio announcer saying that Pearl Harbor had been born, and my mother burst into tears. As a little boy, I didn't understand what this was all about. I just knew that something very significant had happened. It was in this conflict that an American aircraft carrier, the Bonhomme Richard, was off the Japanese mainland and planes were dispatched. And while the planes were airborne, a typhoon moved into the entire area. 50 mile an hour winds, dense fog, and the planes did not have visual contact with the ship from which they had just come. On board, the carrier was a young officer whose name was John Broger. Each plane weighed seven tons and had to land at 100 miles per hour. There was no visual assistance. They did something that day that had never been done before. They used voice communication and radar to find out where the planes were, and to walk them back, and they landed blind without any visual sight on the helicopter upon that ship. On board that ship was a young man who was a very committed Christian. 
His name was John Broger. And when John Broger saw what happened, the idea for FEBC was born. He said, if we can take an airplane and we can walk them back by communication to an airplane, we can use the same technique to bring people to the foot of the cross. And the idea for FEBC, FEBC was born in the heart of John Broger on that very day. Victor Hugo, who was the French novelist, said that nothing in all the world is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. God brought together three men, three men with diverse backgrounds and different skills, but they came together. Those three men, John Broger, Bob Bowman, who then was the first tenor with the Haven of Rest, and Pastor William J. Roberts, and these three came together, and on December the 29th of 1947, FEBC was born. It was the same year, 1947, that transistors were developed by three scientists, John Bardeen, William Shockley, and Walter Bertain. Transistors, tiny, tiny things that allow people to communicate. We have just been in Tacloban. And it was our privilege and pleasure to take a hundred little units and distribute among people who had no radios so they in turn could listen to the good news on FEBC. Transistors are all part of it. On June the 4th of 1948 at 6 p.m. in the evening, the FEBC broadcasting staff sang, All hail the power of Jesus, name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. The story of the Far East Broadcasting Company is a story of dedicated and committed individuals, some of whom have been forgotten by history, who sacrificially gave of their time and some even their lives in making possible the good news of the gospel. One of whom was an engineer whose name was Bird Brunemeyer. I knew Bird personally. He was working at FEBC here when we lived in the Philippines in the 70s. Bird was a kind of different sort of person, somewhat introverted. He would go down to the, the uh, army surplus stores here in Manila and he would buy all sorts of technical equipment. And then being the electrical genius that he was, he'd make it work, and he would find a place for it in FEBC. Bert Brunemeyer had a love for young high schoolers who had a love for electronics. He took my son under his wings, and he gave him a thrill for making things work. My son later became an engineer and has used some of the skills that Bird taught him as a biomedical engineer doing high-tech stuff that I have no idea what it's all about. Bird was electrocuted in a fluke accident in Saipan. Another was Don Bauer, who lost his life in an accident in Saipan. And then there was the pastor in Zamboanga, who along with an engineer became victims of a terrorist who broke in with a gun and shot and killed both of them. Fred McBonwa was a young man who was working for FEBC and also broadcasting at the same time. And there was a light out on one of the towers there and so he put uh, some lights in a bag and he climbed the tower and he replaced the light and then a weird thing happened. What you didn't know, though, is that Fred and Alou said, we're going to go to the United States. We can make so much more money in the U.S. than we can here in the Philippines. And some way, Fred connected, and he heard his very voice. His radio program was being transmitted, but instead, his body became part of the antenna and for the rest of his life, he lived with a hole in his skull about the size of a walnut because the surge of electricity left him alive. In some way, he got down. He said, never again will I think of going to America. I'm here for the long stay. 
He eventually became the director of FEBC Philippines and for many years until time of retirement served the Lord in that capacity. Breakthroughs in communication have all been designed by God to accomplish his purpose. Oswald J. Smith was pastor of the People's Church in Toronto, a great missionary church, and he was a real man of God. He used to tell a story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Here is Jesus, here is the 5,000, and the people grow weary because there's no food, no 7-Elevens that they can have anything to eat. And so a little boy who has five loaves and two fishes brought the lunch to one of the disciples and they brought it to Jesus and he blessed it and he broke it. And they began to feed the multitude. And Pastor Oswald J. Smith said, suppose that the disciples had taken the bread and fed the first row and then fed the second row and then stopped and went back and fed the first row again and then the second row. He said, it wouldn't be long until the people in the back said, hey, how about us? We're hungry. Can't you give us something to eat? Radio reaches the people in the back row, the people who are not reached by ordinary churches. I'm thinking of the woman in Cebu who decided that she was going to end her life. So she took pantyhose, tied them around her neck, and then tied them to a fixture on the ceiling. And she was just ready to step off the chair when my commentary was broadcast over FEBC station in Cebu. And the subject was what God thinks of suicide. She said, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. And she got down from the chair, and she called FEBC in Cebu, and the person who answered the phone told her about Jesus Christ and his love for her, and that day she gave her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Another man was on the back row of life. His name was Milo Altman. He was a producer for Hollywood movies. He lived in the United States. Milo decided that life was no longer worth living, and he would take his life as well. He closed the door, closed the windows, and he turned the gas on the kitchen stove. And he lay down thinking, I will peacefully go to sleep and end my suffering and my life. But Milo thought, I'll turn something on the radio and I might hear something that would be good. And he turned the radio on and instead he found haven of rest, and he listened to the beautiful music of the organ playing that was used at that time on Haven. And then he said, I can't do this, I can't do this. He jumped up, he opened the windows, he called Haven of Rest, and then Haven of Rest called me because I lived in the area where he lived. And it was my privilege to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. Why do I believe in the power of radio? For a variety of reasons. Radio works. It crosses every barrier. It crosses ethnic barriers. It crosses geographic barriers. It crosses cultural barriers. It reaches people where they are with the message that your life can be different. You can find forgiveness for your sins. You can find hope for your despairs. You can find help for your need. And subsequently, we reach the people on the back row as well as on the front row. We have just been in Tatloban. And by the grace of God, we were able to assist FEBC in establishing one more outreach for Jesus Christ. When we think of the past, we think of wonderful years of ministry, but we must also think of the future. And that is why FEBC will continue to replicate itself in reaching people who are unreached. Is every person 
valuable to Jesus Christ? Absolutely. People fall into two simple categories. People who know Jesus Christ and people who desperately need Jesus Christ. In other words, people who are saved and people who are lost. Scripture is very clear. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. During the Vietnam conflict, there was a helicopter carrier that was coming from Cameron Bay in the Philippines to Subic here in the Philippines. On board that ship was a chaplain who happened to be my Sunday school teacher when I was a kid. About midnight, the alarm was sounded that a man is overboard. And whenever something like that happens, all of the sailors on board the ship go to the deck and they circle the entire ship looking for the person who fell in the water. Well, you do not turn a helicopter carrier around like you do a small boat on a little lake. It took them more than a half a mile to turn that huge ship around and start back the way they had come. Finally, one of the sailors said, I see him, I see him, there he is. And they saw a hand that was waving as the ship would rise and fall, desperately shaking his hand. They put a small dinghy over the side and they brought on board the sailor who had fallen overboard. They took him down into the mess hall and put blankets around him and gave him hot coffee and Chaplain Glenn Brown went down and said, sailor, what happened to you? And the sailor said, oh, sir, I, I, I lost my footing and I fell over the side. He said, I could never tell you how horrible it was for me to swim as fast as I could, but the great ship kept moving on in the darkness. I knew I would be lost. And then you turned around, and far in the distance I could see you were coming back. And as you got closer, I realized I would be saved. I would be saved. You know, that's the power that comes when you get the news, your sins can be forgiven, you can have a new life in Jesus Christ, you can be a new person. How does all of this happen? This happens as we come together in one purpose, and that is to reach those who are unreached. It's been my privilege to know many of the people who are involved in FEBC personally. Every one of them is very committed to what it's all about. And together, we move forward. We thank God for the past, but we look to the future to further accomplish the good news. There are still deaf areas here in the Philippines where FEBC is needed. And by God's grace and strength, we anticipate helping FEBC to establish voices in those areas. So in a very real sense, it's hats off to the past and coats off to the future. And my prayer is that the past will simply be the prologue to an even greater future. And that happens as we come together and join hearts and lives and trust God for his be very best here. One of the things that I love about technology is it allows me to have friendships with people all over the world. I have friends, of course, here in the Philippines, in China, in Kenya, Russia, Ukraine, Myanmar, Turkey, Poland, Germany, Romania, even Mongolia. Yes, the world has gotten bigger, but it's also gotten much smaller. I'm going to share with you some of the ways it's shrinking and what it means for the body of Christ. We're all here today to celebrate radio and the incredible history and global impact of FEBC Philippines.
You and I are living in what I like to call the storytelling gap, the time between Jesus' life here on earth and when he returns. Radio has been an important tool in this storytelling era, and what we've thought of as radio has gotten much, much more powerful than ever before. The future impact of radio is incredible. Okay, I might have to have you cycle the uh, PowerPoint for me from the back. Back one more slide. Let me tell you a little story. This is the story of a five-minute Guidelines for Living program, a devotional as we call them today. And our little program has a big job to do. It starts out right here at the desk of Harold Sala, and it's produced and broadcast across the United States. You can cycle the slide. Our little program has a big job to do. This, this particular program is called Peace in an Uncertain World, and its first stop is Manila. After translation in Manila, the program is produced, by, produced and recorded by Pastor Willie Basilio. You may know it as Panantunan in Filipino. From there, it makes its way through the Philippines. There we are uh, at one of our favorite stations, DYFR in Cebu. So after traveling throughout the Philippines, our little program actually has far, far to go. It will travel to be translated, produced, and broadcast by our FUBC partners in places like Cambodia, Mongolia, Indonesia, and Kyrgyzstan. And did you know that half the radio now has internet access? Because of this, the program will be translated into Russian and Chinese and shared online across those great nations as well. The content works because the needs of people never really change. Our needs remain the same regardless of time or place, and God's word does not change. So here's some of the creative tools that we're using today. You're probably familiar with these. The SD card, our fixed tune solar radio, the, the speaker box, and of course, the station in a suitcase. And my dad referred uh, to the new station that was just dedicated in Tacloban this last week, DYFE FM. And we were really privileged to get to have a small part in that station, to be there for the dedication. And as he mentioned, to distribute 100 of those fixed tuned solar radios to families in the Community of Hope Resettlement Village that uh, our partner Operation Blessing is doing a wonderful job with. So today's tools are good, but tomorrow's may actually help us finish the task of the Great Commission. Today, in, ad in addition to our time-tested tools, we have some exciting new tools on the horizon. Perhaps you've heard of software-defined radio, which you see here in our slide. This radio receives high quality digital and analog signals, but it also acts as a computer tablet that can connect to the internet. It can store and play text, audio, and video files, and it acts as a wireless hub so that people that are within range are able to download files from the radio right onto their own digital devices and then share them with others. This means that radio transmitters can act like giant routers, sending not only audio programming, but any kind of digital content, a very exciting new tool that's on the horizon. And then in countries where radio and the gospel is restricted, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots are being used. The one that you see in the slide is disguised as a, as a regular uh, battery power, power bank and it can be unlocked with a code so that any nearby cell phone can connect to this Wi-Fi hotspot and browse through a, a Netflix-like user interface to select and download or stream content from the device, like our little guidelines for living devotional, or even the Bible. Then the device can actually download the content to an SD card and lock the card so it cannot be recorded over. When it's activated, this little device, which is, you can see that's actual size, about maybe the, the size of a small transistor radio, 
when it's activated, it can push the media files to those Bluetooth-enabled devices around them. And it's being used, especially in Muslim countries, in a very creative way. A believer will ride around in the city in a car with the little device, picking up other believers one by one, pushing the media files to their cell phones as they ride around, then they're dropped off and the process is repeated. You've probably heard in the news that global connectivity is just around the corner. Google's executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, predicts the entire world will be online by 2020. That's just around the corner. And we know that satellite will no doubt play a part in this. Counterterrorism experts agree that ISIS almost certainly is using satellite internet to get online and to spread their terror. And developments in satellite technology are being referred to as a revolution. In the State of Broadband 2017 report, the International Telecommunications Union says it is a time of extraordinary technolog technological revolution in space-based and upper atmosphere communications. They go on to say a proliferation of broadband capacity across the globe, spurred by new technologies, is bringing reliable connectivity to the hardest to reach corners of the earth, enabling new capabilities and driving down costs for everyone. The hardest to reach corners of the earth. We can now go into all the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, friends and partners of FEBC, even the hardest to reach will soon be reachable. Technology is helping us finish the task. It's helping us build the kingdom and it's radically connecting us as the body of Christ. Working together, Kapit Bisig, is the way we will finish the task. If you're a kingdom thinker, this is truly the most exciting time to be alive. Best of all, no matter how a person hears, radio will always be intimate, personal, and powerful. God's word over radio affects the most intimate of human relationships. This month, we heard from a listener to the guidelines program in Albania. Moxie is a 42-year-old Muslim husband and father. He's began listening to Christian radio over the last few months. Through Guidelines for Living, Moxie said he was touched by learning about God's love. His family consists of five members, Moxie, his wife, and three sons. Quite often, he used to fight with his wife and sons. He said he never felt at peace as a person, and he used to always find a reason to begin a fight. Sometimes, he used violence against his family members. By listening to these programs about God's love, Moxie began to solve the problems in a different way, by taking into consideration God's love and his peace. Now, he says, his situation is very different. He says he's learned the value of true love. Before he knew about God's love, he thought that violence was the only way to keep his family under control. But he says now he prays with his family members and they all ask for forgiveness of sins and for God's peace in the family. We see, says our Albanian broadcast partner, that the program is helping our listeners change their behavior, change their attitudes, improving their family and themselves. Radio is intimate, personal, and powerful. Isaiah 55:11 promises us that God's word will not return empty but he will accomplish what he desires, and it will achieve the purpose for which he sent it, even five minutes at a time. Radio technology, whether over the airwaves or online, is a powerful tool in fulfilling the Great Commission. But remember when I asked how many of you were on social media this morning? There's something else this technology can do. In addition to changing lives, families, and communities with the power of the gospel, the innovations that God has gifted us with can be a powerful force in bringing the body of Christ together as one. I'd like to challenge you today to not only think of yourself as solely a Filipino Christian, for we aren't just Filipino Christians or American Christians or Chinese Christians 
or even Eastern Christians or Western Christians. As my dad said, Jesus Christ established one church. We're the body of Christ. And today, as in no other time in history, we have the ability to communicate, to share, to collaborate as Guidelines is doing with FEBC Philippines, Cambodia, Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, and in many other places and with other partners around the world. As Steve Moore of Missio Nexus says, the Great Commission is too big for anyone to accomplish alone and too important not to try to do together. We are one body, one church, one mission, in partnership together for God's glory so that his gospel can be proclaimed among the nations. I'd like to challenge you personally to think beyond your cup of bions, your countrymen, as FEBC Philippines has always done. I'd like to challenge you to regularly build your, person, your personal kingdom vision through getting to know brothers and sisters who are laboring with you among the body of Christ around the world. You can follow one of the FEB office, FEBC offices around the world on social media. You can reach out and pray for one another. Let's use technology to learn as much as we can about each other, about the way we each view the world, and about each other's needs. Let's share what God is doing around the globe. Do you see yourself as a world Christian? May I challenge you to ask God to give you a personal world vision. God is indeed a global God, and thus we must be global Christians with a global vision. Perhaps you have a vision, you say. If you work in Christian media, I, I hope you do have a personal world vision, and I hope you're sharing it with others. Do others sense your excitement over what you see God doing and what you realize he can do? My personal vision is to use the resources of guidelines, our 55-year treasury of content, programming, and our relationships to come alongside first-generation Christians, Christians who are among the very first in their country to know of Jesus' love and the revelation of his word. Your corn is ripe today, wrote the Scottish philosopher David Hume. Mine will be so tomorrow. Tis profitable for us both that I should labor with you today and you should aid me tomorrow. The corn has ripened in many parts of the world, yet it's only being planted in others. I ask myself, how can I help those struggling to bring in the harvest in areas of greatest difficulty? Yes, let's ask God not just to help us in our work, but to give us vision. As we praise him for 70 incredible years in the Philippines, let us encourage one another. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Christ to the world by radio is getting more and more doable every day. He will take us from strength to strength. Let's keep sharing the word. Thank you.